dear participants good afternoon good evening and good morning to all who have joined from different parts of globe i am kunjan bagadia lead e bus and public transportation at p manifold hope you all are doing good and keeping safe in this testing times it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to fourth webinar in e mobilogs series jointly organized by p manifold and giz today's topic is very interesting which is on e bus adoption and integration lessons from south asia and latin america where we have onboarded two global prominent experts who will share their experience and insights of largest e bus deployments across the globe first on case study from shenzhen city in china known for its successfully transition to 100% electric bus fleet with total fleet size of 16000 plus buses between various operators and operating models this will be briefly followed up by a pilot experience of super capacitor buses being deployed in hong kong which is a great technological solution for short distance last mile application second case study is from santiago de chile which is home to world's largest electric bus fleet of approximately 500 buses outside china and in phase of transition towards 6000 electric buses in this case study we will understand how private sector investment played a key role in pilot e bus deployments which then triggered for more tenders from the public tenders now i request and invite my co moderator amit gopinath technical expert at giz to share brief about global e bus outlook and forecast amit please thanks kunjan good evening good morning to to our participants uh so as as kunjan said uh, our session is on on e bus adoption and integration lessons from south asia and latin america so before we start i'll just give a give a perspective the global perspective of current e bus so um, if you could go to the next slide please yeah uh, so uh, according to the latest figures there are around 500000 e buses in operation globally and the share of battery operated vehicles is bound to cover sort of 67% by 2040 if we see the first chart which shows the share of global bus sales we can see how the graph has increased over the time till 2016 and gradually uh, the sales have reduced this this majorly could be because of the constraints in terms of charging infrastructure and and other factors like temperature and and adoption rate so gradually we have seen a dip uh, so these uh, so this uh, global outlook has been shared by the bloomberg new energy finance this is a latest figure which was launched early this year and comparatively if we see the see the uh, e bus share globally china has uh, almost 99% of the share uh, of e buses is with china and rest of the world hardly has around 1% so we can we know how how extensively china has been adopting the uh, adopting e buses in their fleet um, and and we could uh, so what we have uh, also uh, got to understand is diesel and uh, and fuel cell buses are also going to be a part of the ecosystem it's not going to be a fully electric bus fleet so the the transition is also going to be a a, a mixed fleet of buses next slide please yeah so on 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 this chart on this graph we can see how the global e bus share has has been uh, has been shared amongst the different countries and you can see how how the growth has been forecasted from year 2018 to 25 and you can literally see how the how the graph of china has gone exponentially high so china has been like um, extensively uh, pushing towards uh, adoption of electric buses when compared to other other cities and countries and if you see india india is quite slow when compared to the other other countries and on the on the next on the other other side we have uh, municipal e bus sales in this we have excluded china because if we if we include china the share cannot be represented on this graph so here we can see uh, rest of europe uh, europe and south korea 
other other global leaders apart from china in in, in the e bus sales so um this could be because uh, like china has been aggressively prioritizing electric buses and they have been electrifying its public transport with subsidies and national regulation so um, we we really need to like for, for rest of the world it's, it's a good opportunity to sort of uh, push towards electrification to to support their um, to support their uh, system and also uh, cut down on their gh emissions and other uh, other tailpipe uh, pollutants uh, i would request kunjan to sort of uh, give a overview of the indian bus transport system where he would be sharing the 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 growth and adoption rates in indian cities thanks amit uh, for sharing that global perspective uh, very briefly like india has around uh, 650 plus e buses deployed as of now it can be seen on the left hand chart the market has grown at a cagr of 265% in last 5 years with last 2 years has seen major uptake of e buses these deployments are primarily are the purchases made by state transport authorities uh, in india which are stus supported through combination of subsidies from central government under fame one scheme as well as their respective state governments e buses are further gaining momentum uh, across various stus in india uh, due to a major policy push from government of india under fame two scheme and uh, there is already a sanction of 5000 plus e buses uh, under operational model Uh, the government has allocated a budget of nearly 41% share for e bus deployments for these uh, buses it is clear that with focus on public transportation and need to increase its bus bus fleet size india has opportunity to leapfrog and become one of the largest global player in e buses some of the major cities in india with their respective e buses are also indicated just to give a sense to the audience uh today uh, we have uh, two global speakers with us first mr alok jain he is the managing director of trans consult asia a boutique management consulting firm he has over 25 years of experience and specializes in traffic and transport advisory services earlier he was working as deputy operations director at kolon motor bus company and spearheaded the r&d work on the implementation of new technology and smart mobility and led the strategy and planning to improve the overall efficiency he is a regular speaker on multimodal integration various public transport operations and management clean vehicle technologies at various forums he is also a member in transport policy committee of chartered institute of logistics and transport in hong kong today mr alok will share his experience of shenzhen e buses and how government supportive policies enabled this transition and what business models and structuring resulted in better cooperation between all stakeholders in this transition he will also briefly touch upon the applications of super technology super capacitor bus technology and its challenges and experience from hong kong we welcome mr alok jain our second speaker is mr manuel olivera he is a regional director for latin american cities at c40 earlier he has served for 6 years as the city director in bogota and supported various projects on hybrid electric bus test program reducing gag emissions and others he has worked as a consultant for various multilateral banks like world bank inter american development bank and un organizations currently he is supporting the 12 largest cities in latin america that have committed carbon neutrality by 2050 Mr Manuel he is going to share his experience of Santiago de Chile where private sector participation triggered some 500 electric buses being deployed with government support and how this learnings resulted in bigger next planning and procurement of 2000 plus buses 
at Chile and Bogota. We welcome Mr. Manuel Oliveira uh, and Mr. Alok. I sincerely hope we will find great value in today's discussion through their insights and experience. Uh, we have a quick poll uh, for the audience. Yeah, so the poll is displayed on the screen. A um, lot of uh, stakeholders and uh, experts have increasingly emphasized on the need for engaging all stakeholders. So how effectively cities engaging local electricity companies and city administration to reduce the descent for e-bus deployment. Please share your ex experience and response. You will have some 10, 15 seconds. Okay, so we have an interesting result that uh, cities uh, probably are not very much effective. Uh, they are slightly or moderately taking steps to engage all stakeholders. We'll discuss and hear more about, uh, more from experts about their experience um, uh, in their uh, presentation. Now I request our first speaker, Mr. Alok Jain, to share his experience. Alok, over to you, please. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so this is, uh, um, thank you for a great introduction, Kunjan. And this is Alok Jain from Hong Kong. Uh, I have been uh, into public transport business for uh, all my life, uh, primarily in Hong Kong. I am currently doing a lot of consulting work even outside Hong Kong, all over the world. We are in field of electric buses, um, I was involved with a lot of initial testing, the generation one, generation two, and generation three, and now what we call is a generation four bus. And we have been involved in testing with, with various Chinese suppliers in Hong Kong and in China uh, during that process. I'm currently also working with EBRD, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, to develop their uh, electric bus policy. I do some work with UITP, International Association of Public Transport in the areas of electrical mobility. For last few years, I have been also been conducting training and tour for international audience to take them to various Chinese cities to show how electric buses are deployed and various type of electric bus operation models. So yeah, if you are anybody of you are interested in, in, in doing more of these on the ground activities, feel free to get in touch with me. Okay, there's always this question that people ask, what did China do? It's like a fairy tale. So until 2015, we hardly, Shenzhen hardly had any buses in, in the city. And suddenly within two years, by 2017, June, um, entire fleet of the city was converted into electric. In less than two years, 16,500 diesel buses changed into electric. It was, if, if, if it did not already happen, I also, me, I would have as think, thought that this was, this was um, unbelievable, this, this was not true, but it has been done. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic case study to, to learn from and, and to see what, uh, what were the impetus to, to you know, make, make this change in the city, because I think every city today would like to go towards that similar kind of transformation and, and finding it very challenging for one way or the other. Somehow things came together in Shenzhen and, I'm, and that's the story I'm going to tell. And just next to Shenzhen, this is like a Delhi, Noida, Delhi, Gurgaon kind of situation. So next to Hong Kong, we have Shenzhen, uh, so next to Shenzhen, we have Hong Kong, uh, literally border to border adjacent city. And Hong Kong, we have found introduction of electric buses extremely challenging. We are doing a lot of trials here, but wide scale introduction of electric buses have been extremely challenging. And, and primarily, this is a classic case study where two cities next to each other, one city makes it work and other city is unable to make it work. Okay, so we will quickly talk about that too. But some of the trials are very nice and, and I'll talk about one technology which is supercapacitor, which not many people talk about when it comes to a clean vehicle or electric bus deployment. So Chinese story, I may have already talked about this. And, and I think the scale of operation, um, if you see in China is basically every five weeks in China, they are adding a London uh, worth of buses. 
So this is the scale. So it's a huge amount of production and huge amount of consumption. Uh, I often take people to, to bus manufacturers in China and, and the scale that you see there is just amazing. Um, if you, I mean, if you, any of you, if you have visited a factory from Yutong, which is the world's largest bus manufacturer, they do roughly 70,000 buses per year from a single factory in Zhengzhou. So it's, it's just the scale in China where these things is just super sized. So how it started was in 2008, basically, I, I write 2009, but 2008 during Beijing Olympics, uh, uh, Beijing administration, they deployed a fleet of electric buses to carry the sportsmen around from one stadium to another, from their residential area to stadiums, so on and so forth. And they were using a swapping technology at that time. And buses had a range of just 80 kilometers per day. And there was a very high breakdown rate and, and all kinds of problems that you can imagine. And these were first generation electric buses. They were not really anywhere close to what you can deploy in a regular routine city operation. But this operation in during the Olympics kind of gave government a bit of confidence that they decided in 2009 to launch this 10 cities, 1000 vehicles program. And they wanted to have uh, some cities take this up and, and build an electric infrastructure because China uh, put a big bet on the future. And I'll talk about the whole business model around it and, and how strategically they thought about this entire thing and implemented as a countrywide uh, transformation and where they could actually even achieve uh, global dominance. So they started with this 10, 10 cities, 1000 vehicle program. Unfortunately, this was not very successful. So 2009 to 13, they had some wins but it didn't really work out. They had some subsidies, um, you know, but only seven out of 25 cities actually met the target. So they, they changed, they started with 10 cities, then they increased to 25 cities, but not many could, could meet that. It was only in 2014 when a lot of data, uh, why this was not successful, came back to the government and government relaunched this whole push towards uh, new, new energy vehicles in China. That's when things started to pick up. Okay, so it is a completely policy driven market. So this is you can see, you can see the energy EV sales in China, how this has changed over a period of time. And Amig was just talking about why sales have dropped after 2015, uh, electric bus sales, global sales. But you, if you connect that to 98% of the global electric bus fleet being in China, you have the answer. The only one person, one country that can really affect the global market is China. And that number is right here. So what happened was they actually reduced the subsidy substantially. So 2014, government launched a new subsidy scheme, which was really popular, and but it had a number of loopholes. And a lot of people started making uh, advantage of that loophole. And then the government broke, came down heavily on them, and they started putting a very strict regulation. So you can see here in 2016, this strict regulation on subsidy fraud and when that happened, the sales of vehicles went down substantially. Of course, after that, it has tried to start, started to come back again. But that was a point where you know, sales literally uh, plummeted. So this, this is, you know, in a way, in a quick sense, there's a lot of Chinese words here which, which talk about different policy measures that the government introduced. Some of the key points I have translated in English. And, and this is, as you know, so it's a electric bus in any country is in the past has been a very policy driven market. It required subsidy because uh, unlike diesel buses, the whole operating model is completely different. Diesel buses is capital, I mean, compared to electric, less capital heavy, but more operation heavy. So that's a higher recurrent cost and, and less capital cost. Electric buses is completely opposite, very high capital cost and less recurrent cost. So you need to create a completely new type of financing models to make it work. These were different subsidy models that the government introduced and the policy measures with, uh, behind it. Uh, Chinese are great in giving names to different policies. And, uh, and, and, and these are, again, straight translation of, of Chinese words. So they basically, uh, the first stage was 2010 to 15, where they wanted to have a demonstration assessment in public for government first push. And then it, it went through this. I won't go through detail in this one. We have limited time on this, but obviously, if anybody of you want to know more about this, I'll be happy to discuss separately. 
this is this is actually an interesting one where you can see uh, what how china try, is trying to develop this whole electric market so obviously as a like india china is a net importer of fossil fuel the cost of fossil fuel was a big concern uh, and and obviously import bills and, and dependency on other countries is very high uh, climate change as you know there was a point in 2013 when world's uh, in the top 10 polluted cities there were five cities from china so obviously that was a big cause of concern for any policymaker for a country that was urbanizing very fast and that was growing very fast to improve the urban air quality uh, and obviously the global climate change was also started to become a conversation topic around that time there was also this huge demand for renewables and china wanted to take a lead in on the renewable technology and they were developing a lot so they invested heavily into wind power and solar power during that era and obviously when you link uh, wind power and solar power solar power the biggest problem is that it is only available for part of the day so you have to store it somewhere and that storage required a battery development and that battery once you had then of course there was a push that can we what can we do with this battery and obvious answer was to uh, do an electric vehicle now electric vehicle has been around since 19th century in fact the electric vehicles were made even before uh, diesel vehicles were done so it is nothing new in that sense and everybody knows electric is is more is cleaner uh, but of course electric has its own issues in terms of operation and maintenance and uh, which i see that the internal combustion engine kind of overcame so when they came to ev then they built the entire business around ev because there was nobody else in the world who was actually doing this so they developed the whole chain of uh, supply chain of oems around that and the components the charging infrastructure and the whole new business line kind of grew around it and of course now they have moved they are moving towards fuel cells and fuel cells that and the same push that they did with e electric vehicles you can see the same thing happening with fuels at the moment they are going through number of trials in various cities and various type of technologies and various type of charging infrastructure and there's a lot of trial and error that's happening and again if you if you look at chinese history they didn't go for single technology when it came to ev they they tried literally everything top charging bottom charging side charging bot you know and um, swapping uh, battery swapping um, charging in motion you name any single way of charging that is available in china and they are actually running uh, those services so they are still collecting data and they have not closed the door on this development of electric vehicles uh, obviously we always talk about electric vehicle being clean but we people say that hey you know the power source is not clean so why are we talking about uh, just the, the buses of course at the point of emission the buses clean buses make a huge impact i can tell you shenzhen uh, just five seven years ago you could not walk on the street it was like like delhi like mumbai you know it's just you would get had a grime on your face in 15 minutes Today, you go to the city, Shenzhen city, and you can walk around anywhere and it's absolutely air is clean. And it's primarily because of these electric vehicles. So at the point of emission on the roadside, where what you breathe, certainly electric vehicles make an impact. But having said that, China has also done a huge amount of um, work at the renewable energy generation. So as you can see from this chart, China is putting a lot of investment in, in renewable energy. Currently, they have actually the investment on renewables in china is highest in the world they have surpassed everybody europe us everybody and they are just putting wind farms and 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 you know solar farms and and, uh, and all kind of renewables actually all over the place so battery production again as you can see the battery production has kept increasing worldwide china has taken the lead one is the ready availability of lithium Second is if you link it to China's Africa strategy, they have uh, actually gone in cities where or countries where uh, lithium is in ample supply and they have tried to uh, be a very active part of that lithium supply chain, whether it's um, Africa, South America, in Argentina or anywhere, Chinese have actually uh, taken control of that lithium supply chain and they have gone very big into battery production. Charging infrastructure. So China has also developed this whole layer of new businesses, which is charging infrastructure. They are all over the city, country. Country in every city, they are developing these businesses. Uh, so if you look at example of Shanghai, there are 200,000 charging stations in in uh, charging points in in Shanghai, of which you can see roughly 
36,000 are public, 32,000 are bus companies, and remaining 130,000 are actually private, privately uh, operated uh, charging points. So these can not just do buses, they do also taxis, they do um, cars, they do all kind of charging uh, in, in every place. They are also putting very active restriction on, on fossil fuel car production side. So every auto, make, auto maker in China, they only get a sales license when they have at least 10% of their sales that was in 2019 is new energy vehicles. So every, product, every company in China has to produce electric vehicles. By 2020, this percentage will increase to 12% and the target is that it will go up to 20% of the production. So every car maker in China, 20% of their production has to be electric cars. So that actually goes a long way in promoting electric infrastructure also. In many cities in China, such as Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, um, all the major cities, you also cannot buy a diesel car if you don't have a quota. But electric cars are quota free. So they are promoting that on the consumer side too. So there's a huge amount of push towards uh, you know, owning electric vehicles. And the reason I'm mentioning cars here is because they are trying to amortize this charging infrastructure because the principle here is that a country like China would people would buy cars and and if you make them buy electric cars that would increase the usage of charging infrastructure that would also increase the number of chargers in the city which will then make the whole electric um, you know, vehicle infrastructure viable so a lot of subsidies and support uh, i won't go into the details of this table but in general uh, a roughly a large to medium sized bus in 2015 was in Shenzhen was uh, eligible for about half a million renminbi which is about 150,000 uh, US subsidy from the local government and 150,000 US dollar subsidy from the central government and you put that in the pot then actually the electric bus was at par or even cheaper than a comparable diesel bus so obviously the capital, the whole fear about capital load at the front end was, was addressed by the subsidy that China was offering. So Shenzhen, uh, you know, how did they do it? They obviously put all the, all the you know, right things together. I'll talk about some of the key steps that they took. So Shenzhen today has more electric buses than, uh, you know, rest of the world outside China combined. So it's a huge amount of fleet. 16,500 buses. Some of you who might be interested in seeing some trivia, I highly recommend to visit this YouTube link when BYD delivered the electric buses. So it was a delivery of 3,000 electric buses in a single batch to, to Shenzhen bus. And you would see kilometers and kilometers of, of new buses just parked in the street in, in Shenzhen. And they were then you know driven to Shenzhen bus depots. So I mean, interesting video to watch. So. So subsidies we talked about. So in Shenzhen, a 12 meter bus, they got 150,000 subsidy from government and um, uh, 150,000 from, uh, from the state government. Okay. So this allowed them to uh, cover the um, cost gap. Okay. But obviously later studies after launch of the services, some of these studies done by WRI in China, they have actually done the calculation based on the real operating statistics. And they find that actually subsidies may not be necessary. The total operating cost of, of, the, of an electric bus could, is comparable and to some extent it is cheaper uh, than, uh, than a normal diesel bus. Okay? So e-bus uh, as a life cycle cost comes out to be about 375,000. Diesel bus is 340,000 uh, at the moment. And if you again, now this was in 2017, but some of the figures that I see now in 2020 uh, the numbers are hugely in favor of electric buses. And that is primarily to do with the higher availability of the bus, more reliability of the bus. So in back in 2017, in China, they were achieving uh, around 70 to 75% of availability, fleet availability. And today uh, it is more than 90%. So, and that makes a huge difference in total operating cost for electric buses, okay? So in, in as a rule of thumb, uh, I always use these numbers that a fuel, in terms of fuel consumption, an electric bus is about 40% uh, cheaper, or sorry, 60% cheaper. So 40% is the cost of energy uh, for an electric bus, and maintenance-wise, it's about half of a diesel bus. Uh, manpower cost is more or less the same, more or less the same between diesel and electric. So once you put this rule of thumb, you can actually work out 
um, these calculations in any city in the world and that gives you kind of a, a guidance on those. Uh, of course, electric buses also required a lot more land in the city um, and especially because of the charging infrastructure which takes some space and they had to um, lease a lot of private land. Um, Shenzhen bus, for example, they have 180 depots around the city. Out of 180 de depots, they, had, they converted almost uh, 150 depots into charging points and charging stations for buses and other vehicles and taxis and whatnot. So, and also there was a lot of private buildings. So one of, I'll show you a picture, I think I have, uh, of one of the big charging stations in, in Shenzhen. And these are multi-story buildings with 600, 700 bus capa charging capacity at one go. So this also reduced the cost of operation for the bus operator because it covered the um, upfront cost. Uh, optimized charging and operation, as I said, there, there is a lot of chargers in the city, uh, which was done by a completely separate business um, where the buses would go or cars would go or taxis would go and buy uh, the power from, from these charging stations. So in, in most of the Chinese cities or in Shenzhen specifically, Roughly, the the ratio of a one bus uh, per bus to a charging point is about one is to three, so one charging point for three buses. So, which is very good penetration of of charging points in the city if you want to run an electric in bus infrastructure. So you don't have to any. So it addresses a lot of range anxiety issues, dead mileage issues if you have so many charging points. Another issue which worries everybody is batteries, and again Shenzhen bus here worked very closely with BYD, which was the primary supplier of their fleet. Uh, they, they tried to get a lifetime warranty, which was eight year warranty for the batteries. And uh, having said that, they did have a lot of problems with batteries in the early stages of procurement. Uh, but because they were into this warranty uh, arrangement with BYD, BYD gave them very high quality support. And today uh, the batteries are, are very stable and they are operating and achieving similar efficiencies then as i said the availability has gone up significantly and achieving similar numbers as diesel buses so life cycle cost so a lot of numbers now kind of um, go around and 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 being worked at so as the data keeps coming and and we gather more and more information so average electric bus costs about 2 million uh, yuan that's the capital cost uh, with the local subsidies and national subsidies uh, which is now changed and and of course the subsidies have been uh, decreased substantially so china gave a subsidy a lot of people bought electric buses and then they are slowly withdrawing the subsidy because they realize that even on an economic value model the buses are viable so people are going to buy it nevertheless so subsidies are being reduced slowly okay so for 50000 km a diesel bus requires 20000 liters of fuel which is you know roughly 130000 rmb uh, yuan Electric bus is only 35,000 yuan. So this is Chinese figures at the moment. Okay? And cost of a charging pole in China today is about 100,000 RMB. And life cycle in that what they use is about eight years. Uh, space requirement is always a challenge. And Shenzhen is now becoming one of the most expensive places to land. And they are afraid that most of these private leases, they're becoming so valuable now that uh, they would not be able to extend the lease on these. And they are worried that that will impact the charging infrastructure significantly but anyway so this is one of the buildings which is a charging station in in shenzhen which can charge uh, in in close to you know five over 500 buses in, a, in a, at any given point of time so the billion people market now why obviously this success story in china or how can be, it be translated to india these are both billion people markets china has uh, close to about 300,000 buses I saw the figures just now that India has about 150,000 buses, which is half of what China has. So one, I think India has very small number of buses, and which which should be, uh, in my opinion, uh, the bus number of buses need to go up. That's one, and two, and once you have the number of buses going up, then you have all these replacement cycles and production cycles and whatnot which is a completely new economy that can be built around it. So these billion people market will actually drive the technology in the world. Smaller countries, because the investment in technology is so heavy, will probably come, will, will be left far behind and, and bigger markets like India and China would, would, would control in future. And if you see the penetration, the way India is growing, actually it's a very good signal at the moment. The growth uh, trajectory is very, very encouraging there. 
So that's on China. I'll quickly move to supercapacitor trial in Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong um, is 90% of the daily travel in Hong Kong is actually made on public transport. And out of which about 30%, 35% is on buses. So in city, there, there's a fleet of about 6,500 buses, which carry approximately 4.5 million passenger journeys per day. Now out of this, and, and most of these journeys are carried on a double-decker bus. So Hong Kong has rough, more than 90% of the local fleet is actually three XL double deck bus. At the moment, and uh, uh, Hong Kong, I mean, anybody who is familiar with Hong Kong, we have very little space in Hong Kong. Only 13% of the urban uh, land area is given to roads, which is among the lowest in, in the world. Most of the countries average average around 20, 25, and US cities are of course 30 plus, but uh, Hong Kong has very little land given to the roads. So it's very congested, uh, road space is at a premium. So we, we are looking for minimum footprint, manpower cost is very high. So when you combine these two, higher the capacity of the bus, better it is, uh, you know, for operators. It's And uh, there's a zero subsidy from government in Hong Kong. Everything, all the bus cost, uh, bus operation in Hong Kong is, is commercial and has to survive on their own. So we have this whole drive towards efficiency where every last drop of blood matters to us. Okay. So under those circumstances, introducing electric buses where the capital cost is too high, where the capacity is too low because it was only available on single deck until recently, how do you put that in cities like Hong Kong? So obviously no operator wants to do it because they'd have parking issues, they have staff issues because you need, suddenly you need two drivers for the same capacity and economics just doesn't work. So what government did, they launched this pilot green transport fund a few years ago, uh, 2013. And they gave 180 million Hong Kong dollar as a subsidy to various public transport operators in Hong Kong to buy a total of 36 electric buses and this was on trial for two years so these buses were given to the companies and they would run it for two years and then uh, government will decide whether to buses bus companies can keep the buses or not but all the data during this trial period has to be shared in public domain and so that they can develop uh, the whole r d around it and develop it in the city so 28 electric buses and eight super capacitor buses so i'm not going to talk about electric buses i think you all know enough about electric buses and there have been other seminar on electric buses and the story of Hong Kong is nothing unique in that respect. But super cab buses, I hear very little about it. So eight super cab buses, I was directly involved in the procurement and, and the uh, testing and commissioning of these electric bus in super capacitor, capacitor buses. This was a very new technology for all of us. It's a single deck buses, passenger capacity of a 12 meter bus, was approximately you know 72 seats uh, 72 capacity with 35 seating uh, roughly 50 percent seats uh, produced by china Youngman. Uh, battery very little as you can see 53 kilowatt hour it was basically cylinders the super capacitors and power requirement was very similar to any other you know overhead charging facilities the trial actually started in march 2017 uh, one big story around it is that when i was putting this uh, infrastructure the buses actually arrived, um, the first two buses arrived with us in the depot in October 2015. And this trial happened and started in March 2017. So you can imagine almost one and a half year, we had buses just standing there in the depot. And the reason for that was charging infrastructure. Getting, putting a charger in public area in Hong Kong was such a challenge for us in those days. And in fact, the charging infrastructure was not a challenge. And my last 50 meter was the challenge where I had to bring an electric cable from a transformer to my charging point. And that took me uh, over a year running around various government departments and, and all the stakeholders for approvals to install that one night of excavation and put in the put in the cable. So, yeah, it is a uh, you know, if you ask me, charging infrastructure is certainly much more challenging than just buying the buses. So initially, when we launched the services, we expect we found that there was some uh, unstable operation due in high temperatures in summer in supercapacitors. So we went to bus supplier and we actually worked very closely with the bus supplier to adjust that. Now the operation is quite satisfactory. Actually, it's working absolutely fine. It's running on one of the routes, which is not very long. It's only about 5.7 kilometer route, okay, which is very highly, uh, very frequent, uh, very high load factors. 
okay and and uh, it's like a feeder route to a railway station okay? so this is how the charging point looks like in a in a bus in a public transport interchange at the moment uh, this is how the route looks which is uh, runs every 12 to 15 minutes uh, from railway station which is as you can see it's a new town plaza is the railway station to to a you know um, dense uh, population in ravana garden so and, and it takes about 20 minutes to full charge so buses actually charge overnight at the depot um, and then in the morning when they are deployed they are charged every time they they stop at the terminus and a charging time uh, is combined with the layover time of the bus as well as the boarding time of the bus so boarding time plus layover time gives you about 15 20 minutes and that is where you do the top of charging okay so obviously so this super cap has has performed very well the operation cost is very good and i actually should have a slide for the performance so it looks like i got deleted uh, anyway so the performance has been satisfactory the breakdowns are not as much i mean initially we had a lot of issues so four buses have been deployed there are four more coming uh, super cap which will be deployed in another route uh, in hong kong in, in an area called kai tak and uh, in my personal opinion super cap appears to be much better than uh, battery buses for short haul feeder services because they charge very fast they are very quick and within with a single charge they can easily do 12 to 16 kilometers uh, in a single charge and um, and obviously they don't have the same issues as battery where uh, you know the quality of life of battery goes down with every charge and every four or five years you have issues with battery you need to replace supercap is much simpler electrical storage technology the only problem in supercap is it's not as stable as battery so the, it doesn't give you a lot of range and it, it doesn't give you a lot of life uh, no life as in gives you the life of the bus but in terms of the charge life so you have to use it immediately uh, literally otherwise you, you you it dissipates so for short haul services supercap is actually a fantastic technology and one must look at them uh, for feeder route network so hong kong as i said we don't have many electric buses what are we waiting for we are of course waiting for double deck electric buses there are some coming london is doing a trial and uh, we are also uh, working very closely in the city with, with various suppliers in the world internationally to get a 3xl double deck uh, electric bus and hopefully we'll be seeing them soon on the on the road share there are some running in london but the key difference between london and hong kong is london doesn't require air conditioning and in hong kong 40 percent of my energy bill is actually air conditioning uh, summers are very hot and air conditioning is is literally a must high humidity high heat and without air conditioning we can't run the bus operation here so that's the key difference why it works in london why it works in many other places but uh, or european countries but it doesn't work in hong kong uh, singapore is also trying to do a number of electric bus trials at the moment and everybody is waiting uh, dubai is trying to go down the same path and they hopefully uh, they will also do some electric bus trial very soon of course the holy grail of uh, em zero emission technology is hydrogen buses and the good news i was just reading a few few weeks ago bright bus in uk they have actually uh, they're coming up with the plan to introduce 3000 hydrogen buses in uh, by 2024 so almost 10 percent of the uk's fleet they are saying will be hydrogen buses and they will only release water vapor so and obviously china is doing a lot of hydrogen related work and we are watching that if hydrogen comes because hydrogen is actually very good for double deck and long haul commercial buses because it's a much more stable um, the problem with hydrogen is that you don't have the charging again uh, fuel refueling infrastructure and and once you have if you can develop that then this is really the technology of the future so obviously this is something to watch out for so that brings me to the end thank you very much thanks alok that was a yep. very interesting well, presentation you. Hello. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Alok. Yeah. So basically, your presentation essentially helps us visualize how big the scale of e-bus operation is actually in China, and clearly says how it can easily create a global disruption. Uh, so uh, going ahead, we have a poll for the audience. Uh, we would request you to, uh, to uh, answer the question: um, How engaged and enthusiastic private sectors for investing in pilot scale-up in e-buses? And with what return? So you have four options for us. Uh, first is high risk, high return, high risk, low return, low risk, high return, and low risk, low return. 
we'll give you five to ten seconds to respond to that question. Okay, so the results are uh, and clearly says uh, it's high risk and low return. Interesting to know and followed up by low risk, high return, and high risk, high return. Okay, so we'll, we'll share this poll results with the audience uh, post the webinar session. Um, going ahead, uh, now we have Mr. Manuel who will be sharing his perspective and his experience from Latin America. Uh, over to you, Mr. Manuel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good evening and afternoon and morning for anyone joining this uh, call. So um, I want to say that uh, even though I used to be a biologist, I began my uh, professional life doing a lot of um, experiments in terms of how cities can evolve in environmental terms properly. So that was my main uh, subject of work for many years, environmental uh, evaluation. And uh, I began to see transport as the main um, driver in terms of uh, development of cities. So um, I began to test buses and be involved in testing buses and learning a lot about uh, testing buses in CNG, using CNG, using, uh, I mean, hybrid buses and the like 20 years ago or something like that. So uh, I began to see uh, transport as uh, the main way to improve life quality of people in, in cities, especially because of the pollution problems that were uh, around uh, not only in the Colombian cities, but also in Latin American cities. So I began to work a lot in, um, in buses. And uh, as you can see, I've been in, involved in this uh, process of transformation of the fleets in Latin America for many years already. So let me uh, take you um, to a couple of examples. Uh, we're going to see how C40 is, works, where is it coming from? How Santiago de Chile became an example to follow in Latin America, how Bogota <clears throat> was in competition with Santiago and became also an example, a um, different example actually, in the, in the same line, but different, and what is coming in Latin America. So this uh, organization is an NGO, an international NGO, which um, is uh, formed uh, with 96 uh, large city, mega cities, most of them, spread through the whole world. It began to exist uh, around 60 years ago and uh, was in place thanks to the mayor of London during those days, um, Mayor Ken Livingston. And then it got the support of many people, mayors, and uh, it was organized as a formal uh, institution with the president of the board and so on. And the former president was the, the mayor of Paris, who is still the mayor, and uh, now Mayor Hidalgo, and now the, the, the chair of C40 is the mayor, Eric Garcetti of uh, Los Angeles. So we have these 96 cities uh, working with us and we help in the cities around the world. And 12 of those uh, 96 cities are in Latin America. Actually, um, Cities that uh, uh, my colleague was talking about, like uh, Shenzhen and uh, Hong Kong, are C40 cities. Uh, so they are examples for other cities. And this is what we do, actually, sharing examples among uh, different cities that are part of, the, or of our organization. We have core funders and programmatic funders. So the, the, the most of the funds that we work with are coming from these three um special especially um uh generous organization organizations and then we have some programmatic funding for programs like for instance cff the c40 cities finance facility that is helping cities to structure projects and to make them bankable uh climate action plans and we expect that uh, most of the cities at least uh, 70 cities in the, around the world are going to have their climate action plans by the end of the year or early next year in order to help 
um, accomplishing the goals of the Paris Agreement. And we have with ICCT, an uh, international organization, a partnership that is called Zebra. And Zebra is there to help cities to deploy electric buses uh, in their cities. Now, what, why we are working with cities? Cities, this is a climate change organization and is there to help cities to work against the problem that we have inherited. And as you can see in this graph, we have been growing in terms of um, human cost emissions since 1990, 1990, because that is the largest amount of emissions that we have covered, we have produced since uh, the last uh, um, uh, several decades. And we need to do something about that. And we, if the cities work together, actually, if the cities um, larger than 100,000 people work together with um, towards the compliance of the Paris Agreement, we are going to be able to comply with 40% of the target of the Paris Agreement. And this is what we are working on. Now, let's have a look uh, on Latin America and why and how we reach this point. So, uh, you may know that uh, Latin America is a little bit behind everything, and we are, you know, looking at uh, some other experiences around the world and see what works, what doesn't work. But still, it's an, an evolving market, not as big as other markets. However, several years ago, actually in 2011, we got some finance, some funds from the uh, from the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, that help us to structure a um, hybrid and electric bus test program in four cities in Latin America. One of the things that we did besides, you know, testing buses that we took from city to city to um, to analyze how this worked, how those buses worked. One important thing that we did was to take around 20 operators and transport authorities around the world. So we stopped in many cities to see the experience that the cities had with hybrid buses and where was um, uh, the case with 100% uh, electric buses. So actually we stopped in uh, Mexico City where we had some hybrid buses in London and uh, in a couple of cities in Sweden, in uh, Moscow, in, uh, and then in China, we visited several places and Shenzhen was an extraordinary example of, on how the city had decided to move um, to transform the, the fleet. The fleet, and during those days, I mean, uh, 2011, perhaps, they had uh, around 800 buses running, and we visited the premises where the buses were. We learned a lot how the buses were having issues, not issues, how the batteries were lasting, where. Uh, I mean, how it was, you know, the, the operation of those buses. And we were building confidence among the operators, among the, the, the authorities that were with us. We also uh, visited uh, several examples in, in uh, Shanghai. And the photograph you see to the right hand is uh, a photograph in a place where they used to shift batteries. That was another example of buses and how it worked. It worked um, with the machine, you know, doing the homework, taking a lot of time, you know, for the shifting, but a very little time actually compared to the time that uh, the buses used to spend when they needed charge. We also uh, learned a lot on how was uh, opportunity charging, the use of pantographs, and uh, the use of um, super capacitors or ultra capacitors. We checked all those experiences during those days. And this was the seed that, at the end of the day, helped several cities in Latin America to begin to, to begin to work towards what we have today. Actually, by the end of the of the of the research, we made the the first, probably the first uh, real comprehensive analysis of the total uh, ownership cost of um, electric buses compared to uh, diesel buses, uh, hybrid buses, and um, 
any other kind of bus that was there. So the uh, result uh, for several cities was that the TCO was positive between 14 and 34 percent for electric buses analyzed in 10 years. So that was the first TCO that was prepared around the world. And uh, of course, um, very few people thought that it was reality. So it took a lot of time, you know, and not a lot of uh, analysis. And we explained that we arrived how this uh, focus was uh, key and they did the, had the same exercise, more comprehensive, more in-depth and so on. And the World Bank did it and uh, ICCT and everybody began to do that. And everybody arrived almost to the same kind of results. So it was very interesting because we, at the beginning we were quite alone. And then uh, when what you can see in Latin America is that many institutions are doing something similar. And then sometimes they think that they are the first, you know, doing the homework. However, this is what we did. And we uh, um, kept, you know, building confidence. It took a lot of time, of course. And uh, uh, however, um, we saw that um, there, there were very few interested suppliers uh, in the Latin American market, especially the um, European suppliers, which are the main suppliers of, um, of diesel buses because they have factories in Brazil and they were not that interested in, in you know, getting involved in uh, electric buses. So we began to discuss with the uh, suppliers in other parts, especially in, um, in Asia. And uh, finally, we brought um, some companies to test buses in Latin America. So we created this proof of concept and this proof of concept was used for several cities to begin to open the door for um, electric buses in several cities. And we did a lot of work on uh, our knowledge sharing with a workshop and technical assistance to some cities. And then here we are. Then we found out that Santiago brought a couple of buses uh, for testing purposes. One company only from those 10 companies that we approached to invite them to get involved in La the Latin American sorry, the Latin American market, they decided to get involved in uh, uh, only one company decided to get involved, too involved in this process. So they began to put buses in different places, in, in different uh, cities, and Santiago was one of those cities. And they brought a couple of buses, they worked with an operator, and the operator um, built his own case. He decided, or the operator decided, to test in real condition these two e-buses in commercial uh, operation, and then uh, he this operator found out that it was so interesting the kind of results that he was getting that uh, he decided to go around the world and see how the market was uh, in uh, you know offering different kind of uh, electric buses how the batteries were produced where they were produced and he finally found out that the chinese uh, suppliers were the the more developed uh, companies around the world so this operator decided to go for the first 100 buses. But in order to do that, he got in connection with this uh, electric utility company, Enel. It's an um, Italian company, large, large, very large, and uh, uh, made an agreement that, uh, that had the um, operator to structure um, a business case. Enel had already seen of uh, the um, uh, had already seen the the experiment that we had uh, carried out in Bogota because we had a couple of buses in Bogota and they were not that involved at the beginning but then they saw that this was um, the line of of, of uh, the market in the future uh, regarding mobility now. How the, the 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 private sector finally got involved? First, Metbus decided to go for the first hundred, and now made an uh, agreement with uh, Metbus. Then they went to the government and told the government, "We need your support." And the government said, "Well, okay, I'm fine, but I'm not going to pay you any additional penny beyond what we are paying for diesel buses." 
if you can make your case under that ceiling, fair enough, we can guarantee that we are going to pay you during the, um, the, the 10 year time that the contract is going to last or whatever, uh, maximum that amount of money. So uh, they also um, tell the Enel that since Enel was going to be the owner of the, of the buses, they told Enel, okay, if this uh, supplier goes away and is replaced by, uh, excuse me, I repeat myself. If this operator is not, um, is not part of the next um, uh, concession of buses, say in one, two, three, three years, we are going to pass your buses and the obligation, the obligations uh, to the next um, uh, operator. So they found that the buses were had uh, 10 years of lifespan, but the contract the, of the NL between NL and Netbus was only 10 years for some uh, financial reasons. Then in 2018, the first uh, 100 buses were launched, but it wasn't enough. So uh, this created a nice competence and um, concurrence. And Engie, another large company that you may know quite well in, in Asia, it's a French company, they decided to go for 100 more. So they bought 100 more at least to another two operators. And at the same time, Midbus decided to buy 100 more. Then we were talking about 300 and then 250 more and then this is growing and Midbus uh, at the beginning said, we will never buy again a diesel bus. That was, they were so convinced that about the, the, how the, the performance of the electric buses were that they decided to never buy again one of those buses. And this is a large operator in, in Santiago. Now, so I was saying that the retribution, that means the payment back to um, the operator and to NL, or to NG is going to be the same, maximum the same of diesel. But it turns out but that all the operators are earning a lot of money because of the saving. So in Santiago, there are actually, because it's a, a large laboratory, we have actually a very good data. And it's the large laboratory outside outside China, of course, and, uh, and other countries in Asia. So the, the facts are, at the beginning, uh, no bank wanted to loan any money for investors to um, go for buses. So uh, the decision was uh, from an L and NG, well, we're going to buy the buses with our cash. They decided to buy BYD and Newton buses because the, those buses were under test. Actually, Yutong brought, when the Yutong sold the BYD had some buses there, Yutong came, finally uh, accepted our invitation to test buses in Latin America, and they brought one bus and put it in the hands of operators. So each operator decided what kind of bus we're going to, to, to use to buy hand in hand with an L and NG. So the two utility uh, companies leased those buses between 20 and 12 years in a lease of uh, 12, 10 to 12 years to operators. And they were expecting um, a range between 300 and 320K uh, uh, of cost. Actually, that was the cost. Between 300,000 and 320,000 dollar cost was the cost of the buses. No single penny from the from the from the country from the city. There was no subsidy for the purchase of the buses, and there is no subsidies besides the the tariff in um, in Chile. Now um, there's some more information here, but I want to move on to another uh, set of figures here. Now. Since the banks didn't want to loan uh, some of the agreements, inside agreements, uh, private agreements was that um, the electric infrastructure was going to be built by the electric utility. So they put the cost in the invoice of electricity. But 100% of the electricity that they need to offer is needs to be 100% renewable. So they need to guarantee that in the negotiation, they offered 40% below the, the cost of uh, the kilowatts 
to the operator and of course that cost is going to be covered by the by the city and then um, different buses have different kind of batteries in terms of, of brand and the what is important is that they the reach guarantee that uh, offers both kind of batteries and actually bus suppliers they offer eight years for eight percent of asoc and 10 years for the 70 percent of asoc that became the the uh, threshold for any other uh, um, uh, negotiation in Latin America. Some additional figures here. So the buses are running uh, running now are more than 452, and there are 150 and, and on a boat already uh, arriving to uh, Santiago. Um, the brands that you have in Santiago are these four brands, and these two never test uh, anything, but they want to get into the business and they have already sold some buses uh, in town. The autonomy proof is between 200 and 250, this, despite the fact that the, the supplier sons are saying that the autonomy is uh, 270 kilometers, or 320 kilometers. Turns out that when you use air conditioning, of course, 30% uh, of the of the consumption um, of the battery goes for to the air conditioning. So the autonomy is reduced. That's it's obvious, but it's measured. Now, what is important to note is that the cost of maintenance, the maintenance cost is 30% of the diesel bus compared to this bus this is what makes happy those make those operators they this is for them absolutely fantastic and the comparison between diesel cost uh, the energy between diesel and electricity is 29 percent below uh in electricity compared to diesel that those are facts and that makes everybody happy and the availability which is a key indicator in the operator in the operator's um life is 99.6 percent this is amazing we never nobody was expecting this kind of availability of those buses and the um, energy efficiency if we can call that the performance of the buses at least for one of the operators is one kilowatt per kilometer let's finish with santiago de chile the public view the public view is we need to to become um, a zero emission uh, country, a zero emission uh, with zero emission cities near um, 2030. So um, they decided to split the tender. Now it's it's a public tender, just, not just the the, the private um, decision um, in the in the current operation, but the public tender for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So they decided to split the tender in one for suppliers, one for operators, one for infrastructure, one for depots, and one for fair collection. So uh, for now, everything is delayed because of um, different reasons, but coronavirus is, is helping uh, badly, you know, the, the process of um, tendering buses. But the total is going to be around 200, 2,030 buses. And uh, at least 75 buses is the minimum amount needs to be electric but you can offer the 2030 buses electric they expect uh, this possible mix the uh, electric cng and diesel although uh, chile doesn't have too much cng so um another difference that is going to take place is that um the lifespan that is accepted for diesel buses is 10 years and for electric buses is going to be 15 years and that's going to change the rule for the contracts so the contracts for 15 years are going to be more profitable for, for the operators and the operators can you know compete for those buses as well let's take a look at uh, bogota because many things also started here bogota was part of the test as well so we, there, there were a couple of hybrid hybrid and one electric bus that were tested uh, around 2011 the results were rather good but you know we need we needed to tell the the bus suppliers you need to adapt the characteristics of the buses to the regulations of the of the countries of the cities because all the buses were um, heavier than the regulations um, allowed 
And they said, no, 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 change the regulations. And we told them, no, you change the box and you adapt to the customer, not the country. This is changing. The, this is the market that is demanding. The market is defining the rules, not you defining the rules for the market. So this became um, a very interesting paradigm for the power suppliers. So they began to adapt their production to the needs of the cities. And now everything is in compliance. They adapt to um, heavy, heavy slopes. They adapt to uh, more or less uh, passengers inside the buses and so on. So Bogota was a little bit reluctant to go for tender and it took some time. And uh, when the, a mayor was going to go for 100% buses tender, um, uh, his term was over. And the next, the next uh, mayor decided to not go for that. But at the end of the day, he got convinced because Santiago de Chile was doing the homework. So they opened a tender in 2018, but uh, no bus, no electric bus was awarded. Although there was an offer of 200 articulated buses for this tender. But in 2019, the city also um, uh, opened a tender and it was for 570 buses and they awarded only 483 e-buses, which is good. And they are going to be running uh, by, I mean, they are arriving, beginning to arrive in two months' time in, in Bogota. Now, interesting here is that different from um, Chile, here we have a, uh, a capital fund, which is called Ashmore, and um, an electric facility in Colombia that is called Celsius, and they decided to put the money, not the banks. Now, since we have a lot of information regarding how CNG buses are performing, diesel buses are performing, and electric buses are performing, this is the difference. So if you um, uh, compare the energy cost between uh, CNG, diesel, and electricity, you have that electric um, uh, cost of energy is far below any other option here. So this is something or a high, very high interest for the for the bus um, uh, operators and for the cities, of course, because this is money that is coming from the fares or from subsidies or from uh, the pocket, of course, the pocket of the users, of the bus users. Some other figures here, quickly. A new tender is ready. It is gonna go in a couple of days out and it's gonna require uh, um, 1,945 buses. Euro 6 minimum, and minimum 631 buses out of this uh, 1900. But you can offer the 1900 in, uh, in, uh, in electric, as electric buses. And um, if you go for electric buses, you're gonna have a contract for 15 years instead of 10 years for the diesel buses. And the autonomy that is gonna be required is this one. So a nail here in Colombia is part of the of the is an interested party, but they are only interested in in putting the infrastructure. They are not interested for now in putting the money. And who grants the payback? The trust fund that is already set and is receiving money. Let's finish with um with a look around the the, the future of um, electromobility in Latin America. We have been breaking a lot of myths. It's very complicated. It has been really hard to break these uh, myths. So everybody was saying, no, I mean, buses are just prototypes. This is too risky. Well, first out that the buses are there, are reliable, are efficient, are viable. And yes, they go up because some people think that uh, electric buses never go up the hills. And we are plenty of hills. Turns out that. Not only they go up, but they also go downhill. So uh, downhill. So um, it's really interesting to see how these myths are break down. In Latin America, despite this um, myth, we started testing eight buses by 2016. Uh, they were in different cities. Today we have more than 1,200 running. We saw 3,000. All to sorry, 13. 1300, but 4,000 are coming soon. So we are increasing the fleet in a very high speed and we aim for 30,000 in the, in the near future. 
Other people said, no, this is only Chinese. We don't want only Chinese. Turns out that Latin America has now the biggest fleet in the, in, in the world outside China. And um, I mean, running and, uh, in, and coming. And in 2025, their emissions must be procured in cities, in, in, zero, uh, in C40 cities. That is a commitment that is in place from any place around the world. Uh, those buses are going to come, and it's not happening only in China, as we all know. Of course, they think that China is only the supplier, but investors are beginning to invest in Latin America. For instance, in Brazil, they are setting a factory to produce uh, lithium-based batteries, and they are beginning to build the buses also in, in Brazil. Now, the issue of guarantees, and everybody was worried, who is going to guarantee these? Well, Look at Bogotá, Santiago, Medellín, Cali, San Pablo. They have guaranteed the procurement process, uh, processes all over these um, recent years. And the banks, they don't want risk. Yes, they don't. So capital funds took the place of the banks, and the water utilities took the place of the banks, which is very good news. So sorry, we don't need any more to beg for loans from banks. That is the, the main conclusion of uh, Latin America and the reason why this uh, region is moving pretty fast, country by country, making an important difference on, on, on speeds in uh, how buses are replacing, how electric buses are replacing diesel fuel or CNG uh, fueled uh, buses. If you want more information about how, how Latin America is moving, you have this e bus radar that, uh, radar that we created with Zebra and our several partners here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Manuel. Thanks for that brilliant presentation. Uh, so uh, we are right on time. We have like around 15 minutes to take up questions from the quest, uh, from the audience. So um, uh, Alok and uh, Manuel, we, we take two questions from the audience. Uh, so a first question that we have for Alo, uh, what difficulties does uh, does uh, he foresee with respect to supercapacitor buses flying into major cities of India like Mumbai? Yeah, Alo. What can take problems do I foresee? Yes, for Indian cities, if they have to take up supercapacitors. So charging infrastructure, as I said, would be would be probably be most challenging. But if you can integrate. Uh, charging infrastructure within, let's say, uh, public transport interchanges or, or close by depots. So you cannot, I mean, one problem with the super capacitors is that you cannot rely on too much of dead run. The whole range per charge is only about 12 to 16 kilometers. So your depot has to be nearby and then your charging facility has to be on route. So that, that, those are key constraints when you design a super cap system. But if you're, let's say, work, serving a, a, a railway station and you are running a feeder loop, circular kind of a feeder loop service, then it's fantastic because a railway station could be your charging point and, and you can just run the loop and then always come there and, and do your layover and charge your vehicles as you are doing the boarding alighting and it's completely safe and then you do the loop again. So, I mean, it, it, for those kind of operation, it's fantastic. Okay, uh, thanks, Alok. Uh, we have uh, one more question for Manuel. In one of your slide, uh, you mentioned that the electricity requirement is 100% renewable. So can you please elaborate more like what is the model of generation and distribution of that electricity for e-buses charging? And is it supplied by the same electric utility company like NL itself? Yes, NL and NG are electric utilities producing energy in Chile. And this is Chile, actually. So as they are producing clean energy, because they are forced by, uh, by their, uh, excuse me, by their headquarters to start, I mean, to move fast enough into zero emission um, electricity generation, clean energy, actually, they are able to supply clean energy to the buses so that was part of the commitment that uh, they acquired with the national government in uh, in chile that said means that if they were not involved in the in the business in chile probably the um, the energy supplier 
wouldn't be able to supply only 100% only clean energy. Uh, and uh, but the, the good thing here is that um, at least uh, um, I think is 60% of the energy that is being produced in Chile is clean. And since these two companies are involved in the production, they can guarantee this energy is kind of energy is coming for the charging uh, system and uh, for the buses. Okay. Thanks, Thank Manuel, you. for that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Alok, uh, next question is to you. This is a very interesting question. Even uh, I had this in my in my head. Um, so, uh, India being a country which is heavily dependent on subsidies, uh, and, and China gradually has removed sub subsidies, and they are, they are uh, requesting about transport agencies to procure buses. So, what do you hmm. think uh, has stopped India to sort of extensively adopt the buses, considering considering such? Uh, what do you think are the constraints for India? So one of the things, in my opinion, and, and it's, of course this is a very opinionated answer, is that in my opinion, one of the reasons why electric buses have not taken up uh, very um, rapidly in India is, is a policy disconnect. Uh, and, and when I say policy disconnect, so central government is of course uh, is creating this fame mechanism and everything. But when you come to uh, the state level uh, and you look at the operating models they are in in every every state they are different the specifications are different the technical standards are not aligned uh, and there are a lot of challenges and and even if i just say i'm an operator and i want to come in and operate on a gross contract cost contract they're not identical around the country. There are different models. There are different type of risk transfers. Uh, and there is no very little standardization. So there is no coherent and consistent approach towards the implementation of electric buses. And what happens is that under those circumstances, most of the transport operators, they tend to take the uh, no risk approach. And no risk approach is due, which you have been doing for the last 40 years and which is just keep doing you know your diesel buses because you know them very well you know how to maintain them you have the depot for them you have everything so there is no need to you know work anything extra because you you need a little bit of a you know when we boil water there is a concept of latent heat water doesn't boil at 100 degree you need that latent heat to make it jump into the steam from water and this is exactly what you need for electric buses if you want to make that jump you need that extra push of latent heat and and that is needed uh, it, through a policy framework for people to jump over from diesel to electric, it requires uh, creation of infrastructure, it requires creation of charging facilities, it requires creation of skill set, and then a coherent policy, uh, then it will work, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, first to Manuel. Uh, can you please share some of the operational challenges faced in Santiago in this deployments uh, in terms of the actual operating range? Like uh, in India, we are seeing like the operating range which is being received by the op uh, transport authorities are in the range of 60 to 70 percent and in some cases even less up to 50 percent what has been quoted by the OEM. So how is the experience around uh, some of the operational challenges in Santiago, and how are you overcoming those things? Right, very good question. Thank you very much. And uh, the the thing is, uh, let's take one of your operators, Metbus. There is the 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 one that is is more advanced in this process, and um, turns out that uh, the the bus supplier was offering a battery or a bus with uh, around 250 kilometers of autonomy. And it turned out that uh, this wasn't uh, the, the actual range for the buses. The buses went uh, up to 230 or something like that, but it was good enough for the, for the operator, the bus operator. They were not really complying, complying against that difference. And everything goes in, um, in terms of the logistics, becomes logistics. So, as you know, there are some uh, time uh, during the day, there is a time where you have the bus completely full, peak hours, and then there is a time where you have uh, less people, valley hours. And 
and the demand is down, so many buses go back to the, the depot. So what the operator is doing is that they make a, a short time of charging uh, of, the, of the buses during the period they are at the depot, uh, during valid hours, and then during the night. So they cover, they have you know, enough energy to run around the city with all the buses without any issue because they, they put a little bit of energy during the day um, in those buses. So it's a um, logistic subject. The other operators that have another brand, in theory, that brand has a better, I mean, a longer range batteries and, uh, and they haven't got the same issue because um, the distances they need to run during the day are quite lower compared to the other operator. But if they have this uh, same issue, they can go back to the depot. Actually, all the buses, I mean, many buses go back to the depot during the day. And they can stay there for 20 minutes, one hour, two hours, more time. And it's enough the time to have an additional um, bit of fuels for the, for the buses to run more kilometers. Thanks, Manuel. Uh, um, Alok, uh, we have a, another interesting question from one of our audience. So um, mm -hmm. he, he thinks actually a supercapacitor is very futuristic for India. So he wants to know, uh, has uh, China or Hong Kong had any experience with uh, battery swapping technology and if they had some uh, quick analysis on the capital cost and operating cost, how it affected uh, when compared to a normal uh, in-built battery uh, in an electric bus? You mean supercap? Uh, comparing uh, battery swapping because he thinks supercapacitor oh, is too futuristic for for yeah battery swapping as an option for uh, uh, for so uh, e-buses. Swap, okay, battery swapping in China that the trials have not been very encouraging and over the years I mean there were a lot of battery swapping um, farms you know but they, they actually created huge infrastructure I'll be happy to share some pictures to you two million square foot kind of uh, you know battery swapping farms depots they created. Uh, where you know you could see 200 300 buses could go in one time and swap the batteries uh, massive ones and i can tell you that today as far as i know that there are only two remaining ones in china all of the others have been closed there are no new cities which are going for battery swapping because of one or two reasons one in a battery swapping system you need a lot of batteries you need literally 1.8 1.9 even double double the amount of batteries you need uh, for as compared to a conventional system so and the cost of battery is still high so battery um, you know cost becomes one of the issues second reason why electric swapping is difficult is because you need a whole industrial infrastructure to make a swap i know some some experiments are happening in india with sun mobility and and ahmedabad and they're doing battery swapping using robotic arms. Uh, I think we have to just see in the long run how, how sustainable that model uh, turns out to be in, in the end. So, but I mean, yeah, the jury is out. It didn't work in China, but that doesn't mean it, it doesn't work anywhere. So it can work uh, probably, you know, we'll see how that experiment goes. The third problem with the, with the battery swapping was uh, the, the issue of dead mileage because you can't put battery swapping everywhere. So the, and when it comes to buses and they have to always come back to some place to do the swapping, which is a, which has to be a standalone facility due to fire loads and all kind of other reasons, because you're storing so much battery there and then um, change the battery and then go out again. So the whole advantage of battery swapping was to optimize the, the range for the buses kind of uh, diminished in that kind of a model. So for multiple reasons, and and that's why it has it has not proven to be very popular um, as far as i know in this region no city is at the moment exploring battery swapping as an option uh, in at least in asian uh, countries nobody is uh, not even in europe that i'm aware of who's, who's actually exploring the battery swapping at the moment i agree on that we saw the experiment in uh, shanghai we analyzed that we put some figures there and and uh, we didn't uh, suggest any swapping alternative for any city in Latin America. Yes, okay, thank you. We have maybe a couple of questions we can take, Amik. 
Yes, Kunjan, we can take at least two or three more questions. Yeah, so I have one question for each. Uh, so I'll first ask to Alok. Uh, Alok, like in Shenzhen, how is your experience uh, in terms of training and capacity building of SQ personnel uh, for this uh, increased eBus adoption? How they have sort of prepared uh, with learnings from OEMs? Can you share some insights on that? Uh, that's directed to me. Uh, yes, yes, in Shenzhen. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so I mean, one way they did was so there were two parts. One is the operations part. One is the bus engineering and maintenance part. So fundamentally, the operation part is not very changed. No, not doesn't change very much. If you already have a very data-driven, digitalized uh, bus operating infrastructure, battery fits in quite easily into that infrastructure because you 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 what batteries require i think the key difference between the old style of bus management and new style of bus management is that old style bus management was buses were run with people's heads inside people's heads so you, you had people who had 20 30 years of experience they know everything as a back of their hand and they can just make decisions they know exactly what to do so but in a digitally enabled modern bus infrastructure you have um avl system you know automatic vehicle location system you have advanced driver uh, assistance systems you have occ at the back end you are doing a proper fleet management you have electronic scheduling and dispatching system once you have all these things then fitting a battery system battery bus into that is not a big challenge because it has certain rules and you rules and you define those rules and parameters and it fits exactly into your your rest of the fleet uh, driving wise a battery bus driving and I, I can tell you i'm a bus driver myself I, i'm a qualified bus driver so uh, uh, the driving wise there is not much difference in drivability in fact i find battery buses to be uh, better some drivers don't like it because the battery buses don't have that you know you know the that room that diesel engine has where you press the pedal and it makes a sound and a vibration and a noise and that gives you the kick you don't get that kick in battery unfortunately it's very quiet you press the pedal and the bus moves <laughs> so it's as simple as that so but uh, drivability wise they are very similar to, to diesel buses it is the maintenance side which is a challenge where you have to completely transform your depots uh, from uh, so if, in a normal bus if you are maintaining 2000 parts in a battery bus you are down to 100 parts you know uh, to looking uh, looking at those and it's clean there is no oil it's not dirty and and you 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 know the maintenance regime is completely different but in case of shenzhen what they did that at the maintenance end they actually got byd to partner with them so byd really embedded themselves uh, in shenzhen bus because they also realized with these kind of big orders that they were placing that shenzhen buses success was their success so they embedded themselves and for them this was the biggest best live laboratory so they went in there, they trained all the staff, they built up the capability and capacity inside the organization. They wrote all the maintenance manuals, they wrote all the, uh, they put all the, you know, the digital infrastructure related to maintenance, uh, automated a lot of processes, and and then handed it over to Shenzhen bus personnel. So I think that, that hand-holding was really, really useful uh, as far as the knowledge transfer was concerned on the engineering side. And by the way, okay. the batteries are still managed by them. So the BMS and the battery management system is still day-to-day uh, -day operations is done by, of course, SOC and all those things are managed uh, by Shenzhen Bus. But the battery chemistry and the major issues related to the battery maintenance are handled by BYD. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the detailed uh, answer. Uh, I have one one question uh, from my side. Last question to Manuel. Uh, and maybe if Ameg has uh, one or two questions, we can take that. Uh, Manuel, in one of your slides, you also uh, mentioned about uh, utilities uh, leasing buses to the operators. So can you please elaborate more on that? Like, is it based on per kilometer basis or uh, per month or what, what's the model uh, uh, between them? Uh, thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate this invitation and, and I need to go after this question. Uh, turn on the card, sorry. Uh, the, the model is, uh, as, okay, they list the buses and they receive the payback from the government. 
So the payback from the government is defined in an equation that has been agreed in the original contract because between the operator and the government. So the operator uh, uh, passes the invoice to the government and the government pays uh, to the operator uh, the, the operational cost mainly, and then to the, um, to the energy facility, the amount of capex that has been agreed for the 10 years uh, time. So the government pays to the um, to both parties, to the operator, the operational cost, and to the um, to the uh, electric facility, the capex. And this is what has been established originally in, in the contract, but they need to agree on how much money is going to cost within the uh, 10 years time of the contract. Now, if the contract is finished uh, beforehand between the government and the operator, the new operator needs to follow the same rules. And the capex is granted to the um, to the um, uh, to the um, uh, utility co company. Now, how the leasing uh, is there is an agreement between the um, uh, the utility company and the operator in terms of the utility company owns the buses and put the buses for the operator to operate within certain rules. The operator needs to be certain parts of the maintenance comply with certain um, specifications of maintenance and part of the, the, of the maintenance <clears throat> in, in the electronics is carried out by the bus supplier. So it's a triangle, if I can say so, based on the equation agreed in the contract between the original contract between the operator and the government. Okay, okay, sure, thank you. And really, I appreciate really very much this opportunity, but I need to go to another conference if you don't mind. Um, yes, yes. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you to both our speakers uh, for joining and sharing their useful insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you Jen. to all the attendees for joining and their patient sharing. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, uh, and Ayushi from my team uh, for coordinating this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.